Ah, hello and welcome. So, if you read the headlines recently, you probably know about the recent merger that was finally completed. After 15 months of haggling with different governments between Fiat Chrysler and PSA Group Peugeot, it creates a huge new company with 14 different brand names and a capacity to produce 8 million vehicles annually. These two companies actually have a past history together involving Europe. Between 1963 and 1979, Chrysler had a division that had control over several different manufacturers and brands, and it was called Chrysler Europe. It took nearly a decade to build and only a few months to vanish completely. But how did it come to be, and why don't they have it anymore? And how did Peugeot become involved? Well, have a seat and get a cup of coffee, and I'll share with you the story of Chrysler Europe. GM and Ford were well established in Europe. Ford had started doing business in England as early as 1903 when Henry Ford put the company together and they opened a production line in Manchester in 1911 and GM had taken over Vauxhall in 1925 and Opel in 1928 as well. Ford England was already one of Britain's largest auto producers even before the war. But outside of America, Chrysler had nothing. The corporation's managers wanted to expand outside the U.S. and build an international business on the same model as Ford and GM that would rival theirs in product offering as well as provide opportunities for export. Export was actually a big motivator. Chrysler was stuck at number three in America because the competition was too fierce whereas Western Europe still trying to rebuild and in some cases still stuck under austerity measures due to the material shortages was a market that was expected to start growing rapidly once those austerity measures were removed. The big question was where to start. Chrysler made a few exploratory offers. They talked to the major stakeholders at Mercedes-Benz and BMW, even reaching out to Heinz Nordhoff of Volkswagen and there were no takers. The first opportunity ended up being in a market Ford had just recently pulled out of, France. Ford France was started with the construction of a factory at Poissy, just outside Paris, after the war. However, France was not an easy country to do business in, given the various different governments that rotated through power post-war. They pursued austere economic policies and adopted a socialist development system such as the Plan Pons that specified what types of cars the country needed, the preferred materials, and they levied huge taxes upon luxury cars and sports cars. The car Ford introduced in 1949, the Vedette, was incongruous with the typical French car of the time being a big V8 sedan. It was too big and too expensive for the average French customer at the time in the early 1950s. After just a few years, Ford decided to cut its losses and sold the Poissy plant and its car line to Simca. Simca is an acronym. Okay, here we go. Uh, Societe Industrielle de Mécanique et Carrosserie Automobile. I'm sorry if you're French that I just butchered your language. A company that dates back to the 1930s when uh, Henri Theodore Pegazzi now there is a French Italian name for you. Uh, he wanted to build cars, uh, he wanted to build Fiats under license in France. From his factory in Navarre, the Fiat Topolino was the Simca 5 and the larger Fiat 508, the Simca 8. Simca built a reputation upon racing success and as economy cars sold well after the war, the Fiat based models continued with just few changes. After the takeover of Ford's works at Poissy, the Ford Vedette became the Simca Vedette and was continued in production and Poissy soon became the main factory for Simca. Simca's expansion continued, taking over a truck producer, a component manufacturer, along with Talbot Lego cars, the only luxury manufacturer that had survived. But this expansion proved to be too much of a financial strain when the first post-war recession hit Western Europe in 1958, a cascade effect of the fallout from the Suez War. Simco was the second largest auto manufacturer in France, but its profit margins were razor thin. Chrysler, who had been shopping for a foothold in Europe for some time, saw an opportunity and purchased Ford's shares in Simca plus some more, earning representation on their board of directors. 
The acquisition gave Chrysler access to an established dealer network in Europe to export its cars and trucks to, while they could now import economical Simcas to the U.S. and Canada. Nevertheless, Simca remained heavily under the influence of Fiat, who still owned a sizable stake in the company. So Chrysler purchased more shares and wanted more control. They bought out the remaining large shareholders and by 1963 had taken over Simca, owning a 64% share, and Chrysler also purchased a majority share in Berairos SA of Spain. So they finally had their overseas empire and the man responsible for seeing this plan in action, the man who had brought Chrysler back from the brink in the early 1960s was none other than Lynn Townsend. Lynn Townsend had started his career as an accountant. Uh, he was brilliant with numbers, he was good at looking over people's shoulders and learning very quickly, and he was known to be very outspoken, making recommendations beyond his ranking at Chrysler. He was brought into Chrysler through his work at an accounting firm that audited the corporation's books. Within a few years, he had turned around the company's finances and was made head of Chrysler's overseas expansion efforts. And after a big shakeup of the company with several top leaders being forced out, became president of Chrysler in 1961. He was only 42 years old. I mean, I'm 42 and I can't see myself running a car company at this point. When Townsend was brought into the executive leadership, Chrysler Corporation was hemorrhaging cash and sales were collapsing. The economic recession I mentioned earlier came to America as well in 1958 and hit Chrysler especially hard. Poor quality but also overstock of unsold cars led to shrinking margins and mounting losses. As the market turned suddenly to wanting smaller cars, Chrysler had misfired with the Valiant and the market share in the U.S fell below 10%. Lynn Townsend was the guy who turned everything around. He created a genius marketing coup with a new warranty program. He revived the company's image. He personally came up with the idea of the world famous Pentastar logo. Soon the Pentastar was everywhere and Townsend wanted it to be everywhere around the world. Expanding Chrysler overseas into Europe, Latin America, and even Australia was Townsend's aim. He wanted to be knocking on the doorsteps of Ford and GM. After the takeover of Simca, Chrysler next became involved with one of the struggling older manufacturers in Britain, Roots Motors. Now Chrysler's fateful involvement with Roots Motors today is seen as one of the most regrettable decisions in either company's history. Yet at the time, it was seen as an opening of a door of opportunities there for the taking. Now, Roots Motors was founded by two brothers, William and Reginald Roots, back in the 1920s. They were uh, car dealerships. They actually were salesmen. And they became quite successful, and they bought a few companies in the 1920s and 30s. Hillman, then Humber, and Sunbeam. Sunbeam was their sports car uh, marquee. And after the war, they added Singer to this. By the 50s and 60s, Roots was well known for selling uh, quality, affordable, solid cars, mostly medium size and larger cars, which would be the Humbers. Uh, but they wanted to add an economy car, which they did not have in their lineup at the time. And the British government, which was heavily involved in the redevelopment of the British economy during the 50s and 60s, did not allow Roots to expand their existing factory, which was called Wrighton on Dunsmore, and instead forced them to build a entirely new factory at a different site. And the town chosen for this project was Linwood in Scotland. It's outside of Glasgow, but over 220 miles away from Roots' existing production facility in Wrighton and their body pressings plant. The government subsidized the construction of the Linwood factory while Roots worked on the design for their new small car, which became known as Project Apex. When the Mini came out in 1959, it was a revolution. It came out right at a time, the timing was excellent, in the middle of the recession. So Roots wanted to get in on that action and the car that they decided to design was to compete with the Mini on as many levels as it could. However, they chose to design a rear engine layout, 
This could be because rear engine layouts were actually quite popular in the 60s. Like you have the Volkswagen Beetle, obviously, the Simcoe 1000, uh, the Renaults, and various others. They also wanted it to have excellent handling characteristics, so they made the car out of lightweight materials. The engine itself was actually an aluminum alloy. Most of the frame was aluminum alloy. It was all very ambitious. So the Apex, called the Hillman Imp, was launched in May 1963. So a car manufacturer introducing an entirely new line of cars designed from the ground up who had never built a rear engine car before, built in a factory 220 miles away by a workforce who had never worked in the auto industry before, introduced four years after the front wheel drive mini, but was rear wheel drive and complex instead of simple. And by the time it got to the market, it went to dealers who had never sold small cars before. In that kind of situation, what could possibly go wrong? Everything! The first strikes that took place at Linwood were a week after the plant opened. The quality of the product that was produced was not up to Roots' normal standards. Not to mention the fact that it was a type of engine they had never made before, being an aluminum, fully cast aluminum engine with an aluminum header, and cars were known to blow cylinder heads and even crack blocks in the first year of ownership. Now part of this was caused by the fact that uh, the owners were not using proper antifreeze. They were putting water in the radiators. Of course, the dealers would tell people to just simply switch to antifreeze. That should cure the problem, but that's it was already too late. The car already got itself a bad name, and the cylinder head gasket problem continued all the way through its entire life in the 1970s. The Hillman Imp never performed as it was designed. It did have some success in BTCC racing, which is uh, Britain's version of NASCAR, basically stock car racing, uh, in the 60s. And it had really quite good handling and a smooth ride. But there were so many problems and there were so many issues with the labor force up in Scotland that just within the first year of production, the Imp project had brought Roots Motors to its knees. So Roots' small car dream had turned into a nightmare. Within just 11 months, Roots was floundering. They were willing to turn to someone, anyone, for help. And that is why, says Graham Robson in his book about the company, the approach by Lynn Townsend of Chrysler in 1964 must have seemed like a miracle. Now, it should go without saying that not everyone, most especially some politicians in France and Britain, appreciated Chrysler elbowing their way into their country's motor industries. The French balked at Chrysler's takeover of Simca, and the deal with Roots was made with a condition that Chrysler would not increase their shares without first applying to the British government. Chrysler applied to increase their share almost immediately. The government was hardly able to turn them down. Without help, Roots would almost certainly go under, so it was all they could do to preserve thousands of jobs and the huge investments they already had made connected to the Linwood project. Linwood was plagued by almost constant work stoppages, and the Imp barely sold 30,000 cars per year, less than a third what Roots had originally planned. Everyone was stuck with it. But it was all over for the Roots family. Chrysler bought out the majority holders and took over, in 1967. Following the takeover of both Simca and Roots, Chrysler continued to expand their influence in the companies. In 1967, the Pentastar became the official logo of Roots Chrysler and Simca Chrysler, and Roots dealers in the UK also became Simca dealers, while some Roots cars were also marketed in France. In many ways, the decision to build a strong presence in Europe was sound. The European market was expanding, as had been expected, in the post-war era, between 1960 and 1965, the number of passenger cars on Western European roads doubled. Car production in France had increased sevenfold, and in the UK at least three times as many cars were being produced in 1967 compared to 1950. The way that Chrysler ran its overseas holdings has been one of the factors in its demise, yet it isn't all that unusual even today. Chrysler tried to exert influence in their new company's products as soon as they arrived. 
There was the issue of the Sunbeam Tiger, a brilliant sports car that was just an Alpine convertible with a big V8 crammed into it, except the Tiger's V8 was a Ford engine, and Townsend refused to allow a Ford engine to power a product in his showrooms, and so ordered a change to Chrysler's V8, which didn't fit. So the Tiger II was only sold in America, where it had to be axed after a year because it could no longer meet safety regulations. Chrysler tried to interfere in the launch of the new Aero range of cars at Roots, the Hillman Hunter and Singer Vogue, and some have argued that the new Sunbeam Rapier Fastback was clearly based on the Plymouth Barracuda. The British designer Roy Axe, of course, insists this was not so. Well, some say there is no such thing as an original idea anyway. Chrysler tried to force a Roots Simca joint project as soon as they could, and it just looks like the kind of thing you'd get from a committee of people who don't like each other, hate the project, and just want to go home. Everyone at the conference table quietly chewing rubbery pastries in awkward silence as the leader passes out printouts of graphs and talks about synergies. The proposal you all agree on is the exact same thing the leader started out with, because nobody wanted to rock the boat. And this is it, built at Poissy, the Simca Chrysler 160 and 180 in France, sold as the Chrysler 180 in the UK as an import. Just like with all those corporate improvement projects, the obvious and actually good solution is deemed too expensive. We only have this budget after all. So a V6 powered version of this car, known as the C car on the British side, and possibly to be marketed with a luxury Humber version, was cancelled at the 11th hour by management in Detroit, and after as much as 30 million sterling had been spent developing the engine. It seemed as if Chrysler was determined to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. But the transformation of the European car manufacturers under the Chrysler banner was complete. The market was split into three regions, and Chrysler Europe was consolidated into three new divisions. Chrysler France, Chrysler Espana, and Chrysler United Kingdom. The Hillman Avenger, designed by Roots and also launched at this time, exhibited the same corporate conservatism. After the imp disaster, the Brits had learned their lesson. No revolutionary ideas, no more experiments. Under Chrysler, Simca didn't do that badly. The Simca 1100, launched in 1967 as their first front-wheel drive car, was very popular and was exported widely, while the rear-engine Simca 1000, which also had a rally version, remained popular in France. Simca's larger cars, the 1300 and 1500, filled demand at the higher market segment, and as a whole, Simca's sales were 349,000 in 1970, and that increased to 384,000 in 1971. France was more or less profitable. The same could not be said in Britain. Chrysler UK continued to lose massive amounts of money. Strikes at Linwood, a regular occurrence now, and persistent quality problems and inefficiencies plagued the British operations. After the launch of the Avenger, for example, more than 20% of planned production was lost in the first year alone due to work stoppages. This was only exasperated by the mounting problems in British society in the 70s. The miners' strike shut down the whole country. Government scandals ruled the headlines, and cash shortages killed car sales. The OPEC embargo then brought fuel shortages and price hikes of auto and heating fuel. And when a four-day work week was imposed by the government in 1974, factories of British Leyland and Ford and Chrysler were plagued by almost daily walkouts. In desperation, Chrysler bosses threatened to abandon the UK completely, shutting the factories down. Chrysler Europe's operations had all kinds of problems, but not just in Britain. Communications between Detroit and the French were slow and inefficient. For years, reports had to be passed through an interpreter Chrysler executives remained ignorant of local trade laws and even local tastes in cars. The Simcas sold well, but the Chrysler 180, with its Anglo-American looks, was a flop. The Dodge Dart, built by Chrysler's subsidiary Barreiros in Spain, was too big and expensive for the Spanish market. Hardly anyone owned a car outside the cities in Spain, and those who did drove Fiats, made by the firm Seat, or light trucks or microcars. The Barreiros Dart was exported to France, for example, 
but given that Chrysler already owned factories there, this made little business sense. That meant that the only Spanish customers for the Dodge Dart were the wealthy and government officials. And this was during the era of the fascist dictatorship. So the Dodge Dart in Spain became associated with Franco. Ugh. And then Chrysler's American cars exported to France, Belgium, Netherlands, and Germany didn't sell. And the French and British products built by their Roots and Simca counterparts didn't work in the U.S. either. The little Simca 1000 failed to comply with basic safety requirements enacted in America after 1968. Import duties levied by the Nixon administration in the early 70s doomed the Avenger, imported as the Plymouth Cricket, just at a time when Chrysler needed it the most. It was during the gas crisis, and Chrysler had no domestically produced compact cars. It was the worst of both worlds. In 1975, British Leyland became the first casualty. After years of inefficiency, they had 40 different factories and 190,000 employees. Now consider this, they were only building about 780,000 cars per year with 190,000 employees. And many of them, like the Mini, for years were being sold at a loss. Leyland was bankrupt and the failure threatened to take the entire Midlands economy in Britain with it. The only way out, the second Wilson government decided, was to nationalize British Leyland. The government took over the entire thing and even kept the top executive, Don Stokes, in charge. The same year, Chrysler hit catastrophic losses. In the U.S., they had three months production worth of unsold cars clogging up vacant lots, warehouses, and fairgrounds. And the only way to stop the hemorrhaging of money was to shut down production. While production in the U.S. was at a standstill, in 1974, Chrysler lost $34 million in the U.K., topping its loss from 1970, and then $71 million in 1975 and plowed another $80 million into its struggling subsidiary. But the British government's rescue of Leyland enraged Chrysler's leadership. If they were going to bail out a major competitor who was also fighting a losing battle with the trade unions, then damn it, they better help Chrysler too. Chairman John Ricardo and President Jean Cafiero, who had succeeded Townsend, flew to London in October 1975, and they went to 10 Downing Street and demanded that if they didn't get a bailout, that Chrysler would pull out and abandon the whole thing to the British government. They told PM Wilson either his government made a deal to bail out Chrysler or else they would liquidate. The brashness of these Americans coming to London and effectively holding a gun to the head of the PM was a scandal and was, was panned in the British tabloids. But the government had no choice now. With the economic disaster that was unfolding at the time, Britain's unemployment was higher than it had been in the 30s. There were 55,000 employees, plus all the related suppliers and dealers that would most certainly go under if they did nothing. You could almost say, though, that Chrysler would have been better off liquidating. Under the terms of this hastily arranged agreement, the government would cover the losses over the next three years, plus capital expenditures, but Detroit was obligated to shovel in another $126 million. Chrysler was forced to lay off more than 8,000 workers, but incredibly, none from Linwood, which was hampered by daily work stoppages because of the huge investments the government had made over the past decade and a half in the area, but most likely motivated by the Labor Party's fear of losing any more Scottish seats in Parliament to the SNP. As I said earlier, Chrysler France was more or less profitable on its own, but the British factories, especially Linwood, never made a return on investments and dragged down the profitability of Chrysler Europe as a whole. The bailout money they received from the Crown in 1975 did yield one result, and that was a badly needed economy car for the cash-strapped time, the Horizon. So the Horizon. The Horizon story really is a story of missed opportunities. So the problem with the Horizon was that it was a product that was responding to the circumstances of the time rather than anticipating it. It was a hatchback at a time when hatchbacks were extremely popular. 
Uh, it was originally meant to be a replacement for Simca's aging 1100 line. And when it was introduced at the end of 1977, it used the 1100s, 1118cc and 1204cc engines. The Horizon was designed and styled under Roy Axe's team in the UK, but the engineering, obviously, was done in France. When it was introduced, it was a Simca Horizon in France and was sold as a Chrysler Horizon for a very short time in the UK. And then, within just a year, it ended up being given away to Peugeot. The Horizon was a, great, was a pretty good car. In the UK market, it was probably indirectly meant to be a replacement for the Hillman Imp, which had been killed off back in 1976 without replacement. But it was not enough, and it was too late. The Horizon had to have a surplus Volkswagen Rabbit engine to work in the US at the time of launch, and with Chrysler's other divisions bringing in massive losses stateside, truck sales were down, the launch of the domestic R-Body was a disaster, and as unsold cars piled up in lots, Chrysler's leadership decided to dump their European holdings as quickly as possible. Chrysler Corporation was trying to hold off bankruptcy at this point, but the major problem was finding a buyer. In fact, no more than a week after Lynn Townsend's departure in 1976, the new chairman, Ricardo, met with executives from Peugeot. But Peugeot had problems of its own. They had just taken over Citron, so money was tight, and it was insisted that Peugeot had to buy everything, all of Chrysler Europe, together, or nothing, and for no small price. Renault was interested, but being wholly owned by the French government at that time, they couldn't possibly take over the British factories without starting an incident. The next obvious partner was Volkswagen, who bought Chrysler's Brazilian factory and also had bought their brand new factory that they had just built outside of New Stanson, Pennsylvania. This time, France was the snag. In 1978, Peugeot and Chrysler were having talks again, and things moved quickly. Some would say, too quickly. The major problem Peugeot encountered was Chrysler Europe's eyebrow-raising debt, which was over $400 million. The agreement, which was hammered out at meetings held in Paris, then New York, then Detroit, was that Chrysler would agree to buy up to 15% of PSA's stock in exchange for the clearance of the debts. Chrysler Europe, which had taken more than a decade to build and cost hundreds of millions of dollars in investment was signed away with some strokes of the pen at a makeshift table thrown up in the middle of Heathrow Airport in July 1978 as travelers walked around them. Overnight, 25% of Chrysler's world production capacity was gone. Overnight, an empire that had stretched across multiple factories in three countries were gone, just signed away. Chrysler's abandonment of Europe was so fast and so sudden that the Chrysler name and their Pentastar continued to appear on the cars for another year. It took well into 1979 for the changeover to be completed. When it was all over, what they left behind was a legacy of mistakes, misunderstandings, and misjudgment. Having spent millions, there was nothing left to show in Detroit but the new Dodge Omni and Plymouth Horizon, which had only come at the very end of the story. It was too much. Too much money, too much time, too much headache, for not enough reward. When Chrysler had arrived to do business in Europe, they were not welcomed. When they were there, they were not liked. And when they left, nobody said goodbye. Chrysler's exit of Europe happened suddenly in 1979, and Peugeot Citron, now called PSA Group, had taken over a multinational organization, a complex line of products with parts and materials going back and forth between them. The Spanish division shipped parts to the French who sent cars to Britain and kits to Spain. The brand names were all mixed up. A classic example was the Aero line, a 1960s roots design still in production. It was the Hillman Hunter, then it was the Chrysler Hunter, but abroad was sold as the Sunbeam Vogue or even the Sunbeam Hunter Vogue. The major change made by Peugeot initially was to rename the entire line of Chrysler-branded cars in both Britain and France as Talbot. 
So the Simca Horizon became the Talbot Horizon, the Chrysler Alpine became the Talbot 1510, and the Avenger, which had started as a Hillman and which was built in Linwood, became the Talbot Avenger, its third name in less than a decade. The Linwood plant was the first to get the axe. Built with government subsidies, bailed out numerous times, and never producing anywhere near its capacity, Linwood in Scotland had not even lasted 20 years. When production of the Avenger finally ended in 1981, it was vacated and left to rot. The Simca name was eventually dropped. The old 1000, which was still being built when Chrysler was around, was discontinued in 1978, and the 1100 was rebadged as a Talbot and lasted until 1982. There would be no new Simcas. All new models would be Talbots, and the last new design worked on when Chrysler left, the replacement for the 180 and 2 liter, which Chrysler blew $72 million cash on development, was launched by PSA in 1980 as the Talbot Tagora, and was made for only two years. The Wrighton plant continued producing Peugeots for the UK market, which had been consistently popular, for better or worse, ever since. Wrighton was redeveloped in 2007. The Talbot name was eventually dropped. By 1986, all the Talbots were rebadged Peugeot or discontinued, including the Talbot Horizon. Ironically, the car that had been cobbled together hastily in the mid-70s, designed in Britain, built in France, and sold there and in the UK, and then brought over to America, lasted longer in America than in Europe. The Dodge Omni and Plymouth Horizon, the last links with Chrysler Europe, were produced stateside until 1990. Chrysler's bosses claimed to any critics that they were still an international car company after giving up Chrysler Europe by way of their ownership of 15% of Peugeot's stock as a result of the transfer. But as Chrysler faced bankruptcy under Lee Iacocca, the Peugeot holdings were converted to collateral in exchange for a $100 million loan from Peugeot. That was perhaps the biggest tragedy of all, was that after, even after selling off 25% of the company, it was still not enough to save Chrysler. Its new CEO, Lee Iacocca, having to go to Washington, D.C. to beg the Senate to bail out the company and two million jobs estimated to be lost out of a, by then, inevitable bankruptcy. Now, we all know how that ended up working out in the end, but that's a story for another time. But now we're left with a big question about Chrysler's adventures abroad last century. Why did Chrysler Europe fail? So the timing. It's hard to fault Chrysler for this when they had no overseas holdings before the war. They were a new company like GM and Ford did. Entering that market, entering the European market in the 1950s and 60s coincided with a number of social changes that were coming kind of hard and fast that Chrysler was not prepared for. And then there were, of course, cultural differences. The American businessmen back in the 1950s really didn't understand Europe all that well. I emphasized some of the differences, especially between the U.S. and France. The Chrysler executives did not understand the French taste in cars, did not understand the local market, and in terms of the U.K., they clearly didn't understand how to handle the trade unions, which then leads into the next problem, the relations between the company, the corporation, and the unions. They should have had some foresight because they had some experience dealing with the rising power of the UAW in the 1940s and 50s. And it has to be said, the Chrysler's executives didn't exactly handle that in a graceful fashion. Where the differences came in, though, was that in Britain, they have trade unions, which is an entirely different thing than the United Auto Workers here in America. See, the thing with the United Auto Workers is it's what's in the name, United. That goes for all workers who work in the auto industry. In Britain, though, they don't have that. They have trade unions. So what that basically means, and I, I don't want to get this wrong, but the, the best, the easiest way I can explain this is that let's say that you are someone who's a welder. If you're a welder, that means that you're in the welding trade, and so therefore you're part of the welder's union. Then let's say you're a riveter, then you're part of the riveter's union. 
There were all kinds of different unions. And then there were the shop stewards. This is, it's not the same as a foreman over here. It, it, the person might not even be a manager. They could actually be on the factory floor, quite low ranking factory worker, but high ranking in the trade union. And the thing is, is because of the unionist credo of supporting each other and not crossing a picket line under any circumstances, if one of these shop stewards who may have represented one of these trade unions, it could be, say, the welders, if he came out in the shop floor and yelled, strike, that meant everybody walked out. And it's been said in many cases that a lot of the workers had no idea what the dispute was over. This is something that Chrysler's management had absolutely no idea how to deal with. And as you can imagine, it just led to mounting problems. There's also the problem that they certainly couldn't count on the local government to be able to issue injunctions or anything like that. That didn't really exist over there. And then, of course, that leads to the next problem, which is the government intervention. You see, in Europe post-war, unlike here in the U.S., where we didn't really need to do a lot of reconstruction, in the European governments, especially in France and Britain, the government took an active role in rebuilding of the countries. They, the government rebuilt infrastructure, was building housing, was involved in establishing social welfare systems, a health care system, and that's then by the 1960s though when all of that rebuilding was done, the government then got actively involved in trying to expand industry and build industrial estates in addition to housing estates, in addition to you, you name it, and forced Roots Motors, for example, to build that factory in Linwood. Now they didn't, they, the government subsidized the venture, but Roots actually didn't need to, didn't want to build that factory there. They were smart. They bought land adjacent to their Wrighton and Stoke factories where they planned to expand. But the government stepped in and said, well, no, actually, we're going to have that preserved as Greenbelt and not allow, allow you to develop there and sort of push them to develop in another part of the country where there was no auto industry. And then all of the problems that ensued from that. Of course, we also have to give a mention to government regulation, especially in the US. Now this may sound a bit counterintuitive at first, but if you think about it, the American government starting in the late 60s and especially during the 70s implemented a number of regulations against the car industry that the industry was not prepared for. Safety regulations, emissions regulations, mileage recommendations, it was a hard number you had to meet. And initially there was there was no negotiation between Detroit and Washington with, okay, what do you think you could accomplish? And then the regulators would hold up, say, an economical Japanese car like a Datsun Cherry with an 1100cc engine in it and say, hey, they're, they're meeting 25 miles per gallon. You should be able to meet 25 miles per gallon. It shouldn't have been a problem until you consider that Chrysler Europe was producing, you know, cars for the European market that Chrysler, of course, wanted to be able to import into the American market as well. And when they tried to do that, they ran into these regulation, regulatory problems. They couldn't import some cars, some models, because they didn't meet safety regulations anymore. Some models didn't meet the emissions regulations that started to be imposed. Some didn't actually even meet the, uh, the, the need for the consumer to have a certain amount of horsepower to be able to perform on American roads. It was just went on and on and on. And then, of course, we have the economic conditions. So this is something that became especially apparent during the 1970s. Now, nobody expected the OPEC oil embargo. This was something that really came suddenly with, without warning. It was the, the fallout from the oil embargo that really ended up dragging down the entire economy. The economic turmoil of the 1970s hit the auto industry very hard, and not just in Europe, in the U.S. as well. And when you combine it with all these other factors, the cultural differences between 
Chrysler executives not understanding the European market, the government intervention, the industrial problems, the strikes, and so on. The economy going off a cliff absolutely did them in. But we can't really close the story, though, without acknowledging the ultimate responsibility, which is of the management. Management was by far the biggest factor, the dark cloud hanging over everything. There are, of course, the obvious differences in how in Americans in Detroit expected to run a car company versus what was expected in France and particularly in Britain. There were a number of high profile mistakes that were made, such as the CCAR program that I mentioned earlier, which was the, well, was going to be a uh, version of the Hillman or actually a version of the Chrysler 2 liter uh, and possibly was going to be marketed with a, a Humber uh, luxury version. The C car mistake with the cancellation of that V6 engine that had been developed at a very late stage happened because Chrysler's bosses in Detroit just got jittery and weren't really sure it was going to work in that market and didn't really need to import a V6 to the US. They had sixes over here. And so they just, they killed it after spending huge amounts of money. Another one was the Talbot Tagora that I mentioned towards the end of the story. That came about with a phone call that came into the executive office and that ended up going to John Ricardo as he was riding in his limousine on his way to his office in Highland Park in 1977 or 78. And the designers were over there in Europe and I believe they were the, uh, the British team needed some money to develop this new car and asked for a budget of 72 million. He signed off. And Chrysler ended up not making a dime of that money back. That car wasn't introduced until 1980, two years after Chrysler had abandoned Europe completely. So it was a dead loss. And there were all kinds of things like this. Uh, then there's the, the fact that when it was quite obvious by 1974 with the four-day work week and then the losses mounting 70 million, 80 million, and then British Leyland getting nationalized, so them going bankrupt. At that point, it was really pretty obvious that Chrysler really needed to cut its losses and get out of Europe. But nobody could say anything because Chrysler Europe was Lynn Townsend's baby. All these kinds of issues all had to do with the management culture of Chrysler, which was absolutely not uh, the way and it was absolutely a problem when it came to trying to run an international business. This is not the way things are done today and we would certainly hope that that's not how things get done in the newest and latest version of the union between all these different European makes. We have PSA and Fiat Chrysler getting together and one would hope that many lessons certainly had been learned from failures such as the failure of Chrysler Europe. After all, a lot has changed. It's been 42 years, and I wish them all the best. So now there could be additional reasons and sub-factors, but I'm interested to know what you think. Let me know in the comments below. Why do you think Chrysler Europe failed? What stands out to you as being like, say, the biggest problem among others? Or are there additional problems that I didn't mention? What was your experience with the cars. Did you have a car made by Chrysler Europe? It could even be a Dodge Omni right here in the States that came from that partnership. Or it could be, you know, Hillman Avenger, uh, the Imp. There's so many others. Simcas. Uh, I'm interested to know what your experience was or if you worked there or anything like that. And so that is the story of Chrysler Europe. A complicated and unfortunate one, but forever fascinating. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that you can consider putting a like on this video and maybe subscribing to support the channel. And of course, I hope to see you again soon. So be well and take care. All right, here's another test. We're just testing this guy to see how it works and seeing if it cuts out right next to my computer. El computador. If you read the headlines recently, you probably know about the recent merger between, uh, yeah. All right, let's try again.
<laughs> it was May 1963, and it was built... Okay. <laughs> the government scandals... Oh, okay, dear God. Okay. Oh, actually... And the Simca was... Oh, my God. that Chrysler was not prepared for. Now, okay. snatched defeat from the jaws of victory.